Um, planning for the Hackfest, um, we've got the requirements working group, charter. Um, now, uh, well, hopefully he's only gone. I, I don't think I saw. Oh, yeah, he's on. Okay, good. Um, so we'll go through that. Then there's the fabric composer pro uh, proposal that we um, we ran out of, you know, we ran the clock last last week, um, so hopefully we can wrap that one up. And um, then there's the whole discussion of top level project versus sub project versus whatever. Um, and there's an email thread here. Let me just paste this in. Um, and um, and so I I think it'd be worthwhile to have a bit of discussion there, and maybe come to some decision. Um, we had, I think, some good discussion on the mailing list, um, and then at least we can come to a decision on how we want to sort of wrap that up. Then there's, um, uh, again, we sort of ran out of time when we were discussing the GSL, the Global Sync Log, from um, um, digital assets, and so I think that some people had some questions, and so we can give Tomas a little bit more time to field some Q&A, and then... Um, there's the internship program reminder that the deadline is tomorrow for um, applicants for the internship program. So actually, Todd, since we don't have quorum, why don't you put that after the Hackfest planning and just cover those two topics up front? Yep, uh, sounds good. <clears throat> um, so really on the internship program, uh, that that's uh, the major thing. Uh, if you know any students or have any connections at universities, let them know our deadline is end of day tomorrow. Uh, we received a lot of good applications, uh, but it doesn't hurt to see a few more come in uh, at the very end. Uh, and then on the Hackfest front, um, apologies for the delay here. We do have a really good option. Uh, we're in final discussions with them, hoping to close on that. Um, we've let them know by end of week. Uh, if that does not pan out, we will move to one of the paid options uh, and get that secured for next week. Um, but, you know, really hoping to host this uh, with a company just to, to save some funds on that front. That, that's that for those two. And um, so back to you, Chris. Okay, thank you. So uh, requirements uh, working group draft. Um, and apologies, I've been completely flat out this week um, and last with travel. So um, uh, I'm... Oleg, is this the final draft? Is this the, the version that the working group has sanctioned and said we'd like to go forward with this, or is this still? Yes, this um, is the, this is final. That's what's uh, been accepted by the oh. group to group at our meeting. Um, okay. I just, I just checked the, the wiki. I see that it's not on the wiki. So uh, last thing to do is just uh, put the final uneditable version on the wiki. But okay. the charter... Uh, the same as uh, I presented last month, uh, we discussed your suggestions and uh, we followed them through. We added the uh, a clause about collaboration, removed a uh, clause about disbandment, um, and it's pretty much um, stays as, as it used to be. And it is final. Okay, are there any substantive changes since the last time we reviewed? Well, um, I, see, uh, I see a comment since it's a live doc. Um, about inter interoperability um, use cases. Um, I guess we can include it as well. Um, but uh, otherwise, it is the same. Okay. All right. I seem to recall, I mean, I think there was, um, I don't think that there was any um, controversy the last time we went through this, other than you still wanted to make sure that you gave the working group an opportunity to to noodle on it and make any any changes and come up with a formal proposal. So, um, given that, um, I guess we can open it up to questions from the peanut gallery <laughs> for Oleg and the, and the requirements working group um, on on the proposed charter. And once we exhaust the, the questions, we can take it to a vote or maybe send it back if it needs to be edited. So, any questions from the TSC? Any concerns from the TSC? Ah, okay. Um, is this thing on? <laughs> Hi, Dad. Um, okay, then I guess we can um, take it to a vote. So, Todd, you want to 
do the uh, wait. Do we have quorum? Today? No, we're we're still one shy. Uh, so just checking quickly, uh, have been Mick uh, or Tamash joined at this point? Uh, I'm reminded that I think Mick is at a some sort of research conference today. Ah, okay. Um, so Chris, we're one shy. We can push this to an email vote today. Uh, just noting that there were no no questions, comments, or objections from the seven TSC members here, and hopefully we can close on that through email. That sounds like a, yeah, thanks, Todd. I think that sounds like a reasonable proposal. Do you want to send a note, or do you want me to do it? I, I can get a note out right after this call. Okay, thank you. All righty, um, agenda. Next up is Fabric Composer, and again, we sort of ran the clock. Um, Simon, I think I saw you on. Right? Yeah, hi, Simon here. Awesome. So, um, you want to remind us all where we left off and um, and maybe a link to the proposal in the chat is, oh, there it is. Thank you. Um, so, we went through this last week um, where I just covered what Fabric Composer is. Can't hear you. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Um, so we went through the proposal. Last week. Um, we covered that Fabric Composer is a, a layer of abstraction that runs on. Uh, Simon, Simon, you've got an echo, 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 echo. Um, are you on a headset or are you on Wi-Fi? What, what medium are you using? Is that better? You know, say something more. Hey there. In an echoey room, that might not uh, help. You're very faint right now. Okay, let me just um, try a different phone. Uh, and again, oh, hey, okay. Did you move that? No. So you would be a man of the we have <laughs> audio working up? Seem to be working. I can't. Don't think anybody can follow yeah. what's being said. I, I'm not sure if he's still listening or. I'm in he's there. I saw him drop off the go to meeting. So who's where's all the background noise coming from? I, I think it's independent. Oh, Simon is back on the meeting. Ah. I don't think he is the one who generates the background noise that we call we all listening to wondering what the <laughs> hell this is. Hi, Simon here. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Very, Sorry, guys. Very my, um, we're a bit short of offices, and my uh, desk phone is apparently pretty rubbish. So. Uh, ah. Okay. Okay, but so there's somebody else who's generating noise. It'd be nice if we could shut that off as well. Seems good now, so go ahead, Simon. Okay, Simon, um, proceed. I think we can hear okay, so um, last week I covered the, the proposal document. I think we went through all of it, actually. 
um, where we just discussed that Composer is a layer of abstraction that runs on top of a blockchain or distributed ledger. Um, it provides a level of business abstractions that make it much easier and quicker to develop solutions on top of this technology. Um, so it's not a, a blockchain or distributed ledger by itself. Um, I covered all, all the components that we built um, and some of our future plans. Um, since the call last week, uh, we had a company called Oxchains come in um, as, a, as a sponsor. They're very interested in building um, formal verification <laughs> to the composer language to um, verify uh, smart contracts or business network definitions. Um, so are there any questions on the proposal um, left over? I know we finished, um, when we called it quits last week, we were discussing uh, the feasibility of porting it to other ledgers. I think hopefully I answered those questions. Yeah, maybe you could just uh, remind is... people of the architecture that essentially allows for a backend to be, you know, to have a, a plug-in, so to speak. Maybe you could... Yeah, sure. So 90%, um, I would say, of the Fabric Composer code base is um, platform neutral. Um, there's two parts that are platform specific, and we, we have Fabric implementations of those parts. The first part is the connector part, which the client uses to communicate to the blockchain, or to the platform, rather. We have a Fabric implementation of that. And the second bit that is platform specific is the bit we call the runtime container. So we have a whole bunch of common runtime JavaScript code that implements uh, data validation, transaction processing, um, but we obviously need to bind that to the platform somehow, so we have a runtime container layer. So in order to port Fabric Composer to other platforms, we would need a implementation of a connector to enable client applications to connect in, and a runtime container to allow the uh, platform to host the Composer runtime code. Hey, Simon, this is Dan. I, I missed part of your presentation last week, so I apologize for that. In in looking through the proposal, I it wasn't uh, clear. I had assumed that what Composer did was it was like a, a code generation tool to generate chain code. Uh, can you help clarify for me that role versus some of these runtime aspects where it sounds like you're directly connected to a live network? Uh, sure. So we don't generate any chain code. Um, we're not doing any code generation at all. What we are doing is we have a generic composer framework chain code, which we call the runtime, and you can deploy business network definitions to that runtime, and they are, um, the business network definition is a collection of model files describing the structure of assets, participants, and transactions in the network, and also JavaScript functions that implement business logic, and we call those transaction processor functions. When transactions are submitted to the business network running on the blockchain, um, the runtime picks those up and executes those JavaScript functions that the user has built. So, so it's, it's listening on the network for transactions, and then it's, uh, it's no, no, uh, no, no, no. So, so I think Simon, I think there's, I think you need to have clarity about the fact that, I, and, and maybe I'm mistaken about this, but I don't believe Composer is involved in the runtime aspects of things. We use Composer to create a model, and we populate a runtime. We populate chain code with the JavaScript, and then that just runs in the fabric, right? So we have a, a common chain code that is business network independent, and that executes JavaScript code that is stored in the business network definition, which is stored in the world state on fabric. So our client APIs wrap the fabric client APIs for use of a connector, and they submit fabric transactions to our chain code, which in turn executes composer transactions. And those transactions occur within the chain code that is on a fabric node, or those are executing on some other node? Uh, correct. The um, the transaction, the composer transactions are executed in the chain code running on the fabric nodes.
they interact with the fabric APIs through our runtime container abstraction layer uh, to interact with the world state. So for all intents and purposes, we are just a standard fabric application. Uh, uh, can you move to yeah. Sorry, I have to mute everyone. Um, I can't just mute a phone caller. So, uh, Simon, let me take you off mute. And anyone else that wants to talk, you'll need to go back in and take yourself off mute. Thanks, Todd. Okay, so did you did you catch my explanation, or do I need to go through that again? Uh, I think I, I got that. So could you maybe just speak a little bit more about the definition of a business network in this case? Yeah, sure. Um, so a business network definition is a collection of three things. Um, there's a composer model file, and that's sort of like a, a schema. It describes the structure of the assets, participants, and transactions in a business network. So the set of properties on an asset. Um, and the ID, for example, or the, the color of the asset, um, as, and a set of relations to other assets or participants in the business network. So, for example, a car asset might be described by the make, model, and color, and it will have a relationship to an owner participant, um, so the, the owner who owns the vehicle in that case. And you might have different types of participants in a business network, such as owners, uh, regulators, in the UK's case, the DBLA, um, manufacturers who uh, create new vehicle assets. And we also have a set of uh, definitions in the model file for transactions, so the inputs to a transaction. Um, so when I'm submitting a um, transfer vehicle transaction, I would say which vehicle is being transferred, uh, who it's being transferred to and from, and maybe the, the fee associated with that. And those, the transaction inputs are all modeled in the composer modeling file. Um, we've built a, a modeling language that allows you to define that business-centric um, custom modeling language. The second part of a business network definition are transaction processor functions, and those are written in standard JavaScript, the, the way for our users to implement their business logic. When someone uses the composer client APIs to submit a transaction. They provide the inputs to the transaction that have been modeled in a modeling file. And then the JavaScript code that they've provided to implement the business logic is executed on the blockchain. The third part of a business network definition are access control lists. And we can define, or rather the users can define, which participants have access to which resources. So you can say that the owner of a vehicle has access to the vehicle, uh, the regulators have read-only access to all vehicles in the business network, and we enforce that access control automatically at runtime. The business network definition also has a name and a version. Um, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was just going to ask you exactly what you meant by access. Is that visibility of the data? Is that uh, ability to change the data? Both. Okay. And then, uh, so those security properties are, uh, I guess, abstracted over whatever would be intrinsic within the fabric controls? That's correct, yeah. We built our own access control layer around the fabric controls. Interesting, thank you. Other questions for Simon? What are the, um, this is Vipin, by the way, uh, what are the, um, uh, you know, will there be inefficiencies introduced with this? Meaning, you know, does the speed or the scalability or the, uh, any of those properties get affected uh, negatively by interposing this business network on top of the fabric. Uh... Um, interesting question. Um, we haven't done much performance analysis at the moment, but I would say that um, when we've looked at chain code in the past, 
Um, the bulk of it is made up of really boilerplate code. Um, so you've got boilerplate code for error handling, access control, data validation, RPC between clients and the actual chain code. And that's all stuff that Composer takes care of automatically so you don't have to write that code. Um, we can work to make that code as efficient as possible um, and let users focus on their business logic. Um, so for the simplest use case where you just want to do basic key value stuff within the chain code, yeah, Composer probably doesn't help you, but it's, it's really going to help any um, sort of substantial uh, chain code development by reducing the amount of code users have to write. And I think the, the performance trade-off from them writing it versus us writing it is it's going to be insignificant or not significant. Seven measures. Yeah, Simon, hi, this is Lenny. Good morning. Does uh, Composer provide functionality um, to identify membership and to ensure that there is a layer of security over the members who are sort of um, <coughs> interacting and generating transactions via Composer? I just want to understand if it's a complete bona fide solution. Um, as an hyperledger blockchain, as well, a hyperledger blockchain solution, or is it more for modeling and rendering so that um, users can understand um, the, uh, <coughs> the functionality behind blockchain and, uh, and, 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 and determine what might be the best set of uh, transactions to, uh, to put together a production uh, solution? I'm just trying to understand how will it be used vis-a-vis, -vis, say, um, what's the other one, quarter, and uh, say, fabric. Um, so, so the start of the question was around do we do access control and do we identify participants submitting transactions to the business network? Yes. Correct? Okay, so yes, we do. Um, we use fabric certificates and we can identify who is submitting transactions from the fabric certificates. We map fabric certificates to participants that have been modeled and stored in the world state, so the record of who you are is stored in a participant registry, and we issue identity to those participants, and our identity in this case is a fabric certificate. We perform access control based on the participant rather than the fabric certificate. So we just use the fabric certificate to identify which participant you are, and then we use uh, the participant to perform access control over what, which assets and, and data you can read, write, and update. So it's a bona fide solution overall. The generation of the blockchain using Composer provides a bona fide solution in comparison to, say, um, Fabric or um, Corda in terms of maybe complete solutions. I just want to ensure that what could replace Corda, say, with Fabric Composer because they would provide the same types of functionality. So, yeah, Composer is a framework to accelerate the development of applications on top of Fabric. Okay, so, okay. That, that describes the complete thanks. Any other questions? Other question. uh, so coming back around to the multi-platform aspect, um, I, I don't have a particular bias about whether it it should strive for multiple platforms. I would just like to understand what the what the intent is, um, and that uh, I think something, a tool like this, it kind of stands as a separate kind of capability that's not reflected elsewhere in, in Hyperledger to begin with. So uh, we'll probably have some more discussion about this multi-platform aspect for, for project hierarchy later, but uh, it would maybe help inform that discussion too. Uh, to say what the intent is, so we've designed Composer to be platform independent and we started off doing that because we wanted to run it in several places not just fabric for instance we can run the composer runtime in a web browser to enable a web-based playground experience um, which doesn't require you having to set up a fabric instance to just get started and try it out 
Um, and we can also do the same for standalone Node.js applications to allow things like automated unit testing with JavaScript test frameworks. We're certainly happy to work with the community to port this to the other platforms if there is interest. Do you think that the concepts like uh, the interaction with chain code would be unique to Fabric? Um, not sure. Um, the, the interactions between the client and the Fabric are very basic. They simply invoke chain code with a list of string arguments. Um, which then get passed to our Composer runtime running inside the chain code. I would hope that's not too different from the other, the other platforms. Let, be... let me try that a different way. Is, is the intent to, would, would the chain code be kind of the, the pivot point, that, that any blockchain system that supported chain code, that would be your target, or is your target really more that you want to do composability for any blockchain uh, irrespective of whether or not it supports chain code. So our, our intent is to keep as much code as possible in our common JavaScript runtime and anything that can host that JavaScript runtime is able to use Composer. Okay. And then this is maybe a little bit too low level but I'll ask anyway. As far as those access controls, the the data, I assume, has to be encrypted or something when it's deployed out to the blockchain, and then there's some sort of uh, key management through Composer that would uh, then provide that access? Not yet. So we don't currently do any or help users do any encryption of data that's stored into the blockchain, um, and that's something we're, we're planning on working on soon. We know we need okay. to get there. Okay, but that would be one of the mechanisms to enforce the, the access controls? Uh, it could be, yeah. Uh, Simon, just my benefit. Is uh, Composer the integration within Hyperledger already? Or is it a proposal to, um, to be integrated within the fold? Uh, this is a proposal to integrate it. Okay, yeah. That would be helpful, I think, because it has some really unique and very remarkable uh, features. I think it's something that I'd like to see a demo of at some point in time. So there's a, there's a call at 4 o'clock, which will be an introduction to Composer call. I'm sorry, it couldn't be before the TSC meeting, but... Okay, so how does the TSC want to proceed with this? That's, so we're at a very important junction here. Okay, so other questions? Hearing none, Todd, I think we should put it to a vote. Dan, have you got all your? Yes, thank you. So, Todd, we did still, we get quorum during We still the... don't have quorum, yeah. No, unless... Uh, right. ben... Hi, guys, sorry. Unless Ben this or... This is Rob, uh, had a question. Oh, okay, go ahead, Ron. Um, sorry, I was uh, talking to a doubly muted phone earlier. Um, so um, my mental model is that uh, uh, the <coughs> composer can uh, plug in as a smart contract component, uh, if you think from an architectural perspective. Uh, and so uh, it, it is trying to implement the abstract um, smart contract uh, and asset participant uh, and smart contract modeling and execution environment. Um, so is there a well-documented interface between the smart contract layer and the rest of Fabric? And uh, you know, is that a simple um, um, thing to extend that to the other projects? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that interface? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, we have common JavaScript runtime code, and that runtime code hosts <laughs> A runtime container. Uh, that runtime container is platform specific, so we have a Fabric implementation of the runtime container, and all that sim all that does is map our composer calls to put assets in registries and get assets out of registries to interactions with Fabric's key value store. So, if we wanted to port Composer to 
other platforms, we'd simply need a new implementation of the runtime container. Um, whilst it's not particularly well documented or described in our documentation, um, the interface is pretty simple. Okay, and so so the uh, the the actual uh, transaction semantics is that tightly coupled to the fabric uh, kind of model or I'm just trying to understand how portable it would be or how much work it would take to kind of abstract this as a common smart contract module um, that can be leveraged across platforms. So I think the abstraction layer that we built around assets, participants and transactions is not fabric specific at all. Um, so I think as long as we could port the code to work on the other platforms, it would be fine. We wouldn't need to change the, the abstraction layer. So Simon, could you explain the rationale behind the name Fabric Composer? Why is it being called Fabric? Because we have projects like Hyperledger Fabric. I'm just trying to understand if there is some relationship or degree of, 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 of similarity. Um, so naming is a, is a great question. Um, so all the work we've done to date has been called, has been built on top of Fabric, um, which is why we've initially gone with the name Fabric Composer. Um, we have gone through several other iterations of names as well. Thank you. Yeah, so I think if there was a discussion to think about that, names, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I, I think Simon, I think, you know, Brian certainly, I think, made a point that, you know, maybe it should be called Composer simply because it, um, I mean, especially in light of the description you gave for how it could have, um, you know, uh, a binding to Sawtooth or Corda or whatever. Um, and so maybe just for, you know, to leave that option wide open and, again, encourage others to come and potentially build adapters and, and you know, runtime components for their respective um, uh, DLT platforms that we just sort of name it Composer. Yeah, I think well, that how, how, how about how about the composer? I think it depends on the the project team's intent. You know, I, I don't want to have artificially encouraged people to look for uh, kind of platform independent uh, positioning if that's not really what the intent of the project team is. So if the intent is really just to support Fabric through the mechanisms that Fabric has, I was trying to kind of catch up on the reading in the the chat log there. And it sounds like it's it might be a little bit more uh, bound to the the fabric architecture than I was understanding from the verbal description. But I guess respective of what the state is uh, today versus what it could be tomorrow, I think it just kind of comes down to whatever the project team's intent is. Well, so um, again, I, I think I would have to characterize it this way, Dan. I think architecturally and you know, Simon, or if Dan is on, you know, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think architecturally, there really isn't tight binding, if you will, other than the fact that the, you know, the runtime, you know, the chain code that they wrote and, uh, you know, that, that you deploy that runs the JavaScript aspect of the Composer model is platform specific. Um, and some of the concepts that we use are platform, I mean, well, I, I don't know if they're platform specific, but, you know, the, the, the bindings to those concepts are certainly platform specific. It doesn't preclude that in something like Sawtooth that this couldn't map to a transaction family and that you could have a transaction family container, if you will, that could execute the JavaScript model. Yeah, it was so, the the uh, ACL linkage to the the fabric mechanisms that I was referring to. But but I I agree and and understand that the the state today doesn't necessarily reflect what the state could be tomorrow. What I would just like right. to and, suggest is that the, uh, and, the project and, team's so I just intent to follow, is right. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to follow up by saying that I think that you know if there were to be um, you know, uh, a mapping to Sawtooth that I would kind of expect that the Sawtooth um, uh, community would um, 
would be in, you know the ones that are you know sort of uh, helping to drive the bus in terms of the implementation of that. Um, you know, again, yeah, open source. You know, you have an itch and you scratch it, right? If you have an interest in doing something, then you roll your sleeves up and you and you start doing it. So, I mean, I think that I think that it's fair to say that the initial intent of what we were doing when we were building Fabric Composer was to have something that worked with Fabric, but we also architected it in such a way that it wouldn't necessarily preclude integration with other DLT platforms. And um, uh, but you know, again, I think it'll 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 depend as we go down the road whether or not you know any of the team that's working on Fabric Composer gets a bee in their bonnet to you know map it to Sawtooth or Oha or Corda or or Ethereum or what have you, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree that as far as getting any sort of integration and you need to have contributors that are willing to do that. And there's yeah. no there's no interest in, in my part anyway for the TSC to try to mandate that on a team. It's more just if if the intent of the project is to be platform independent, then go ahead and reflect it that way. And if the intent is to be uh, fabric specific for now and then address some sort of platform independence when that does become a demand then I, I think that's has equal merit. Brian, are you still on? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, um, so I think certainly the latter. Um, we're not planning on looking at adding in compatibility um, anytime soon. If the demand is there and the community wants to help build that, then great. We're more than happy to help help out there. All right, then I suggest maybe just let's call it Composer, and then that way we don't have to worry about it down the road with any confusion. How about hyperledger? Simon just said. Okay. Uh, Simon, like that. Simon was just saying that the intent was to focus on fabric and to leave it that way. I'm sorry, Dan. You were there was two people talking at the same time. I couldn't hear. Yeah, sorry. What I understood Simon to just say was in suggesting the latter that it was the the intent was to focus on fabric for now and to leave it that way. It, it, it is, that's right. But again, leaving the door wide open for other collaborations, I think that naming it Fabric Composer sort of closes that door. That, that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. well, I, was, I, was, the door so much as, I don't know if it closes the door so much as it makes it, 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 it almost seems like there's a you know, keep out sign on the door. That's all. Sure, sure. So I, I very much hear your your viewpoint that you would like that to be open. Um, and I well, think I, that the that you're reflecting a project team view there. I was proposing calling it a hyperledger proposal because it looks like it provides some very interesting capabilities that are very useful within hyperledger in terms of the entire family of hyperledger projects. All, all hyperledger. Your projects would kind of implicitly have Hyperledger on the front of them. That's right. Yeah. But if we wanted um, to call it Hyperledger, we, Hyperledger Composer, that could be fun too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Todd uh, reminds me that we still don't have quorum. We have seven of eight. Um, so we're going to have to take this to the mailing list. Um, and Todd, will you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you please send a, a note with the other um, Will do. for a vote on on uh, composer, um, and and maybe Simon, you could just sort of uh, you know drop in a, a note that I, I I think we can call it whatever the team ends up wanting to call it. And, um, And we'll just move to that. Okay, so next up is the discussion on um, the subprojects, which is sort of relevant here. Um, 
uh, you know, the top level versus sub-project discussion. And I put a link in earlier. Um, if you scroll up in the chat, um, there was a link to the email thread that Dan started and then I piled on and then uh, and I think Hart's note is the one that sort of captured what I think a lot of people um, uh, resonated with. And let me see if I can pull that note up here. Here's Hart's. Uh, that's Hart's note. <clears throat> and Hart, do you want to uh, maybe describe the, the sort of the proposal that refined the what the you know what I was was uh, sort of suggesting? Sure. Um, I just thought it would be useful in proposals to have project dependency designations, and that would kind of solve all of this issue. Um, you know, kind of, it's clear all of the SDKs are, are dependent on, you know, sort of the, the projects or whatever the main blockchain platforms they're working with. And there should probably be some accountability. Um, that the, the SDK groups are, are responsible for, you know, going back and and working with kind of the top level projects. Uh, and so I just thought a, a way to, to gracefully handle this uh, this debate over what should be a, a project or not was just to, to have people list their dependencies uh, in their project proposal. This would allow kind of projects to proliferate, and that's probably a good thing because people like ownership, and it might encourage people to do more. But it would also uh, kind of keep some accountability and, and sort of a chain of command in place. Um, that that's essentially a, a summary of what I said, and probably too many words in that email. <laughs> no, I thought it was just right. I and I, as I noted in the thread. Uh, I think this is a, a really good way of uh, addressing it. And so when you, you know, when you create a proposal and you list the dependency on Sawtooth or Roja or Fabric or Cello or what have you, then I think the expectation would be that, um, uh, you know, before you bring it to the TSC, that you run it up the flagpole with the maintainers of that dependent project, um, and uh, and then the proposal sort of acknowledges that that group um, uh, was comfortable with the proposal and um, and then that would uh, I think address mixed concerns although he's not on um, uh, it would address mixed concerns that there are proposals for or there have been proposals such as the um, proposal for the go SDK that we couldn't really decide at the TSC or some of the members of the TSC I should say where you know, just sort of felt that they didn't really have um, sufficient context to do a um, uh, an effective evaluation on the technical merits of the proposal, um, uh, and uh, and so felt uncomfortable making uh, a decision based on a lack of context. But if the you know if the project proposal had been run by the fabric maintainers previously. And the fabric maintainers were all good with it, um, then uh, then obviously that would assuage the concerns on the part of someone like Mick who didn't have the same context. So um, I think uh, you know I think that what we could do is we could change the um, the template to indicate whether there's a dependency and and then provide some mechanism within the proposal uh, template for the um, for the dependent projects to sort of sign off, if you will. Um. So, Chris, this is Arno. I, I am yeah. I'm sorry I was uh, absent for a few minutes because as I was hitting unmute button, my whole system crashed. And so, which is double <laughs> frustrating. It's frustrating normally, but w just when you want to intervene, it's uh, even worse. But uh, so, I don't exactly know what happened. I, we, you know, uh, you guys were just talking about this question uh, for a uh, composer as to whether you know what the intent really is and I was going to say well I think this 
this brings us into this bigger discussion of the, you know, uh, um, how the different projects that we are being proposed uh, relate to one another. And so one thing I wanted to say with regard to us. Point. I think it's a good idea to list the dependencies, but what I wonder is, should we also list the potential dependencies or what you could say the applicability of the technology? And I'm a bit, I think there's a, a big question that TSC we need to consider is, you know, we are, one of our responsibilities is to kind of set the direction for the project as a whole. And I, I hear Dan and Mick, they've been saying, well, you know, I don't mean to push people into trying to be more like platform independent if they don't intend to. And I understand that at the same time, I think there is value in encouraging convergence. And this will only happen if we do recognize when a component could actually be, you know, even though because of history, like in the case of Composer, they started with Fabric. So it seems like, well, you could consider this to be a dependent project from Fabric, but maybe we'd be missing the opportunity to recognize the applicability is actually broader than that, and there is value in recognizing this and encouraging, you know, the porting uh, Composer to other platforms. And of course, at the end of the day, it's an open source project. If nobody is willing to put, you know, to, to, to do the work, it's not going to happen. But from a TSC point of view, I think we need to not fall into this this kind of like, you know, the, the, the risk of, of saying, well, it's not, nobody wants to do it, therefore it's dependent on fabric, this is a fabric sub-project kind of thing. And we would be missing the opportunity to, to, to lead towards some convergence moving forward, which I think is desirable. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I just wouldn't want to to have people feel like they had to play, pay lip service to being platform independent, that really wasn't their, their okay. goal. I, I think I understand that, that's fair. So it, it, it's Richard, it, sorry, I've only, I've only been partially paying attention, so I'm sorry, I'm about to say something that's already been said, but is there not just an easy, assuming I've understood the problem on this, is there not an easy way to cut through this, simply by saying that if, if a project currently works only with one code base and was built by people associated with that code base, then it just seems obviously and naturally the case that it should live, live under that umbrella. And um, as it develops functionality, either because people have contributed to it or there's been some refactoring, whatever it is, if it gets to the point where it, it also works under the code bases and it's just emerged obviously and naturally from its from its behavior that it shows that it, it actually is um, now covering more than one code base. It's, it's an easy matter at that point to, to graduate it to, to top level in the same way as you know, quite often you see projects spinning out of other projects when they take on an independent life of their own. So it's a case of, you know, I guess, so rather than looking at the intent, look at the actuality, but be, but be completely willing and open to, to, to revise its classification when, when, when the facts on the ground change. I think it can be quite pragmatic. In support of uh, Richard and also to answer Arno's question, I think Hart already provides for this expansion by uh, saying that the list of dependents could be expanded on the fly, meaning like when the reality uh, happens that uh, they support both uh, Composer and, I mean, both, um, let's say, Fabric and uh, Sawtooth Lake and Iroha, then you can uh, you can expand that list. So that is yeah. already sort of in our <laughs> proposal if you read it uh, carefully. And I, I suppose we should also mention it and change the uh, template document to reflect this if everybody is in agreement. I, I agree with it, but I, you, my concern is that what we're talking about, what I mean, this mechanism of extending the dependencies as the project increases in scope, I can see that, but this is reactive, right? It's basically documenting what's going on. What I'm trying to say is maybe we still need to have a way to express a desire in the direction the project should be taking or could take at least. So in the case of Fabric Composer, if we said, well, here are the dependencies today it depends on Fabric. I think that's a fact. We could just say that. At the same time, we could say, but you know, it could also, it's not completely bound to Fabric uh, forever, but you know, inherently it could actually apply to other frameworks. 
and I think there's value in recognizing this and so maybe this like two list it says list the dependencies and the potential uh, applicability or list of other dependencies potential dependencies I don't know you want to call it I don't think it de there's dependency when it's not there yet so that's why I don't think the word dependency would yeah. work for this but it's so, more like applicability right yeah sure I yeah, mean, so I, I, yeah, I agree yeah. uh, that maybe the the section should be changed to uh, include that possibility meaning what is the intention which is what Dan was asking earlier too right this is more like an intention, signaling the future in some way. So, yeah. I, well, but it doesn't have to be I, a I commitment think, either. That, yeah. No, but that's a very good proposal because we, if I can say this is Leonard, this is a very good proposal from Finland because it would allow us to express and explore future uh, relationships or dependencies or integrations, and that's the whole thing. Everything's going to change, and we have to manage change. So that's yes. one way of allowing change. Thanks. Okay, so again, I think you know that the way that Dan, uh, that Hart rather described it in his note actually does provide for the expansion as we discussed. I do not think that it's necessary that you go in and get a mother may I from everybody that might possibly ever want to use a particular thing. If there's intent to collaborate immediately with that other project, yes. But if the intent is not there necessarily and somebody else comes along later, then I think it's just like a charter revision. You just expand your dependencies by you know, collaborating with that project and adding the dependency. Um, I, I don't, I don't I, I, I think we're maybe overthinking this is really what I'm getting at. I do like the dependency thing because that basically clearly connotes that this is related to that and that for purposes of bringing a proposal to the TSC, if there is such a relationship, then that needs to be expli you know, explicitly made. Um, and, uh, and, and then again, I think that the, the dependent project, the, the parent, if you will, needs to basically have their maintainers sign off and agree that this is commensurate, this is consistent with what we're trying to achieve. Um, so what I suggest for this is that I um, I'll work on a, a tweak to the, to the Hyperledger incubator proposal template and, um, and then we'll look at that over email and then uh, take a, a vote next week on the, on the change. Um, uh, thank you, Vipin. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll shoot you a draft um, and uh, we can collaborate on that. And then, um, um, uh, Simon, I would suggest that, um, you know, you know, this, this is going to go out for a vote. I would suggest you just sort of Maybe get with Dan and Catherine and 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 uh, your uh, friends at Oxchain and and figure out what name you want to go with, and obviously put Fabric as a dependency since there's that. And uh, what I can you know what we can do is we can get the uh, the Fabric maintainers. I think we've mostly seen this um, to uh, to weigh in. Okay. So Chris, okay. there is a related question though that I'm not sure what the answer is. So if you if I could, it's just because, so, uh, I think there's no disagreement in listing dependencies that seems to be a good idea and we're all going for this. The question that I'm not sure about is, what is the decision process? Are we saying, well, if this is kind of like dependent on uh, a top-level project and there's no intent to make it uh, something more than that, uh, it doesn't come to the TSC or does it still come to the TSC? Um, if it wants to be a top-level project, yeah. If they want to have their own maintenance. No, no. And so so if it's not, if it's not, uh, if the intent is not to be a top-level project, uh, then it doesn't have to come to the TSC at all. Uh, what's the process? That's oh, so for instance, if you wanted to add a new feature to Sawtooth that turned transaction families upside down or something, that I mean. No, no, so like the, 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 you know, I see like Dan was talking about the SDKs, 
I mean, some of this I think have come to the TSC. They were a big chunk of uh, of code that were brought by sometimes teams that are not completely related to the core team of the project, and they were brought to the TSC as new projects. And what I'm saying is, you know, is the proposal that if something depends on the top level existing top level project, then doesn't have to come to the TSC because? Oh no. So again, I think that. And, and Hart, correct me if, if I'm wrong about this, but I think what you're, you know, what you were advocating for, and I think also what I was advocating for is that look, there, are, there are times when you really want to be a top level project. You want to have your own incubation, you want your own set of maintainers, you want, um, uh, you know, a certain amount of independence, but yet by the same token, you have a, a technical dependency, you know, from an interface perspective on another project such as sawtooth or fabric or what have you one of the others and so therefore it is a top level project it comes before the tsc however from a technical evaluation perspective as to the merits of the proposal vis-a-vis -vis its dependencies that you really wanted to make sure that those dependent projects are basically also signing off saying yeah this makes sense okay so Chris has run it here. <laughs> Very interesting um, uh, the way you put it. Is that the actual process? Is that the process, oh, sorry, project approval process that you just um, explained there? If that is, it has to be documented so it's clear to everyone because with process we have to simplify and therefore we need to ensure that everything that's been discussed here is covered so we can handle, we can know what our dependencies are, we can determine whether this project gets approved as a parent or high-level project in its own, its own merit or it remains uh, a sub-legend level project. So we need to have this project approval process. And what you just said seems to me to constitute a lot of that process. So we need to define it and document it <laughs> so everyone understands. Leonard, I think it is defined already. I don't think we need to change the definition. I do think we need to add the dependencies, but the process for proposing the project has been there since the very beginning where we had the project life cycle that describes exactly how you go about doing this. Well, that, so is I don't think that is good. So if it now encapsulates everything we've discussed today, it doesn't need changing, and that's what we say. So we'll add, well, it right. does need some amendments based on the dependencies. So we'll get that done, and then we'll view together as a team to make sure that it satisfies all. So I think that's great. That's a good discussion. Thanks. Okay. All right. So we're two minutes over. <laughs> we got a couple of mail uh, things. Tamash never joined, so we're we didn't we didn't get to the GSL obviously, but um, uh, I think. So, so the other thing, and for I, I, have, uh, again, I, I apologize, guys. I, I messed this up. I I'm, forgot that you have a change of the daylight saving an hour earlier. I apologize. Oh, Tomasz, you just joined. I'm sorry. We had all this dead time where we expected you to be talking. <laughs> uh, that's, I'm, it's really a shame, but I, I missed uh, missed. Uh, you, you have two weeks of difference in the daylight saving change, and I missed it. We, we were no uh, ensconced in a completely different discussion anyway. That's right. And <laughs> no worries, because we understand. And, um, Next time, Tamas yeah. is on top. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, uh, what, was I, what I was going to say is, uh, so I will work with Zippin on the template uh, changes and any necessary other changes that we want to tweak into the life cycle. And then um, I will also sort of go back to the security team with the Go SDK proposal and have them, you know, make that change, and we'll get the, uh, you know, the fabric maintainers to review it and so forth, and then we'll bring it back hopefully next week, along with um, um, uh, uh, along with the with the composer. So. Um, uh, again, thanks everyone, and apologies for running a little bit over, and we'll talk to you all next week. And everyone have a lovely day. Talk to you guys later. Have a fun.